welcome to the third and final session on the applications of Nestor Interval Theorem. Today we are going to prove Borsanov's theorem. It says if f is a continuous function from a closed and bounded interval a, b to r, then it is bounded. In fact, one, one can also prove it attains its bounds. That means there exists x and y so that f of x equal to f of x is the maximum of the function f on the interval a, b and f of y will be the minimum of the function on the interval a, b. That means f of x is greater than or equal to f of s for every s in the interval a, b and so on. And this, uh, if time permits, I will prove the second part that such a function attains its bounds. Otherwise, the direct thing I want to prove give uh, an application of Nestor interval theorem. Okay, so keep that in mind. It all depends on the time. Let's get started. Yeah. So like uh, previous two sessions, the reference remain the same. And my article, Nestor Interval Theorem and its applications, contain okay a lot more uh, number of applications of Nestor Interval Theorem. Those who are interested can download and read. Okay, so let us get started. So what do I have? I have let us again recall the definition of continuity. Suppose let us say a b to r. Okay and x is a point okay x, x naught is a point in a b then i say f is continuous at x naught if for every epsilon positive there is a delta positive so that mod x minus x naught is less than delta x is in the interval call it j x is in j and that should imply mod fx minus fx naught is less than epsilon. In the last session I also introduced the geometric meaning of that. The geometric meaning was this. Suppose I have f x naught form an interval f x naught minus epsilon f x naught plus epsilon okay and this is your x naught there exists x naught minus delta x naught plus delta and give me any x here then f x should lie somewhere here in this interval this is the geometric meaning mm -hmm. right if you had watched my earlier video on intermediate well theorem i said continuous functions have some local properties okay for bound on there is a local property what does it mean Okay, if yeah, okay, let's assume f is if f is continuous at x naught, then it is locally bounded. So what does that mean? That okay, this is what we want to prove. But even before local boundedness, let me try to explain what is meant by bounded. Suppose I have a function f from a set to r, I say f is bounded if there is an m positive so that for all x in capital X mod f x is less than or equal to m. Then I say f is bounded on x. Right? So the theorem we want to prove today is the following. Let f be a continuous function from a closed and bounded interval. When I say it's a continuous, what does it mean? Continuous at every x in a b. Okay. Then f is bounded. That means that is there exists a m positive so that for all x and a b we have modulus f x is less than or equal to m okay so pause if you are a beginner pause review proceed
so you should understand what is meant by a function being bounded next what the theorem is about this theorem is credited to Borzanov's yesterday we saw Borzanov's theorem okay this is the first mathematician in that name okay so when I want to say it's locally bounded suppose you from an okay some interval in R to R okay and assume f is continuous at x naught okay then f is locally bounded this is a local behavior okay this is a local behavior local behavior or local property so what do I mean by this that means there is a delta positive so that okay and and m positive so that for all x in j with mod x minus x naught greater than delta we have f x is less than or equal to m so I have x naught minus delta x naught plus delta so start with any x that x also should be in j okay the reason why I am saying x should be in j is I am assuming the interval j may be closed at one point or closed at both end points or it may be unbounded etc etc all possible interval okay but what all we require is continuity okay you understand this okay so how do I prove that so let f be continuous at x naught okay so what it does the definition said for every epsilon positive there is a delta positive so that x belong to j and mod x minus x naught less than delta should imply mod fx minus mod fx naught is less than epsilon yeah this is the definition okay right now let us apply this to epsilon equal to 1 for epsilon equal to 1 again there is a delta positive so that for all x in this is for all x in j and mod x minus x naught less than delta we should have mod fx minus mod fx naught should be less than 1 but what do I want to prove I want to prove local boundary that is I want to find an m so that for all x in j mod x minus x naught less than delta I want to say mod f x is less than or equal to m okay how do I do that since I know this from this I want to get an estimate of f x mod f x therefore this I can write as f x minus f x naught plus f x naught right now apply triangle inequality to this number and this number therefore it's less than or equal to mod f x minus f of x naught plus mod of f of x naught right now for x in j and x minus x naught less than delta we know this is less than 1 right yeah therefore if I take so if I take m equal to 1 plus mod f x naught okay then for every x and j with with an x delta d distance from x naught we have mod f x is less than or equal to m in fact it's strictly less than m but it's okay okay we proved this so pause review proceed So if you notice, if you have followed my other, the second session also, you will see the stated theorems are going to be global theorems. Okay, in the earlier case, I said if f is a continuous function and which is not vanishing at some point, then it is either positive or negative. Then I said it will remain positive in small interval around it, the point. Or if it is negative, it will remain negative. Then I want, I want to say if 
F is no okay. It remind should remain positive everywhere. What I wanted was the continuity of the function f on the entire interval and it's non-zero. If it is non-zero, then it will retain the same. So that is the global property of the local property. So here also we want to prove the function is bounded on a closed and bounded interval. So what we observed was forget it the moment f is continuous at x naught then it is locally bounded. So we want a global version. Okay. And again towards the end of the proof we will use the local property to conclude the global version. These are the subtle things if you are a BSc student I am sure you will have some you will struggle with these kind of ideas but just watch it once or twice then you will understand and even if you understand about 30 40 50 percent of these abstract things that's good enough believe me when you go higher then everything will become crystal clear then you will have much more insightful about the subject okay right let's go back okay so the first thing is I want to recall the so-called Archimedean property what it says is okay given any x m and r there is a natural number n so that n is greater than m so think of the number line you give me any m then I can find a natural number n which is strictly greater than n okay the in, in other words the set of natural numbers is not bounded above that is n is not bounded above in R in other words no real number is an upper bound of n ok again try to understand if you have not seen because argument and properties usually not emphasized ok right please learn these things well and if you have gone through my real, real analysis real number systems I have done all these things there ok so starting with upper bounds lower bounds least upper bounds least upper bound property argument and property everything is done in case you have not seen watch them please watch them ok not necessarily for exam purpose just watch them that's good enough right ok now let us look at this. so I am given a continuous function a from a b to r it is continuous ok I am going to prove by contradiction right so suppose there exists suppose there exists no m in r or no m positive so that ok mod so that for all x in a b mod f x is less than or equal to m remember when f is bounded above ok if is bounded what does it mean there exists m so that for all x in a b mod f x is less than or equal to m right so this is the thing therefore what is the negation negation f is not bounded what does it mean given any m positive there exists an x in a b this m is not given upper bound that means what there is at least one x so that mod f x is greater than m yeah so we want to prove by contradiction this is what we have right now the next okay so so suppose f suppose f is not bounded okay right then I claim for every natural number n 
okay what do i know okay go through this for every natural number n is positive therefore there exists and let me write a small n there is xn in ab such so that mod fxn is greater than n yeah so i am using this thing but i am not choosing any m positive i am choosing only natural numbers n maybe i should rewrite this so that you know what i am writing yeah right keep this in mind okay these are the preliminaries in case you have not seen my courses on real number system etc it is good to review foundation etc also remember this kind of negation is very important okay right now i wanted to use nested interval theorem what do you think i will do okay so the idea is suppose i have ab okay suppose this is not bounded okay take c to be the midpoint then the interval ab call is j not okay is ac union cb right if f is not bounded on ab then f is not bounded at least on one of them sub intervals right suppose here mod fx is less than equal to m1 for all x in ac and mod fx is less than equal to m2 for all x in cb then if we choose m to be maximum of m1 and m2 then mod fx will be less than equal to m for all x in ab right therefore okay the function will not be bounded in one of them do you understand that so i i will call this as j1 ha huh? choose a sub interval if there are both then choose one of them well okay a1 b1 of ab that is this is either of the form ac or of the form cb okay on which f is not bounded okay and call it as j1 okay so what are the properties of j1 j1 is a subset of j0 and length of j1 is half of length of j0 which is b minus a and f is not bounded on j1 right now we repeat the same process suppose i have j1 a1 b1 and take c1 to be the midpoint then either f is not bounded on this or f is not bounded on this okay so call j2 okay which is either a a1 c1 or c1 b1 on which f is not bounded then what are the properties i have j2 is contained in j1 that is contained in j0 length of j2 is half of length of j1 that is therefore 2 to the power minus 2 of b minus c and f is not bounded on j2 yeah very good. right so by induction assume we have found jk con jn contain in jn minus 1 contain in j2 contain in j1 contain in j0 such so that okay length of jn is 2 to the power minus n b minus a okay and 2 f is not 
bounded on Jn. Okay, and suppose Jn is A and Bn, then how will I get Jn plus one? Now all of you know by now, my An, Bn takes C in the midpoint, so F is not bounded on this, or F is not bounded on this, and choose that as Jn plus one, then Jn plus one will be contained in Jn. Length of Jn plus one will be half of length of Jn. Therefore, it is two to the power minus n minus one b minus e right and f is not bounded and f is not bounded on n plus one therefore we have your nested sequence of intervals Jn says so that I will write again the definition Jn plus 1 is contained in Jn for all n and 2 length of Jn is 2 to the power minus n b minus a and 3 f is not bounded on Jn which is a and b n right notice that these are all closed and bounded interval therefore I can apply nested interval theorem so, okay pause review proceed so you can apply nested interval theorem right because these are all sequence of closed and bound intervals which has nested and their length converges to zero right okay therefore there exists an x call it x naught which is in a and b n for all n this is same as saying intersection j n is n equal to 1 to infinity if you write this is singleton x naught there is a unique point right now notice that therefore x naught belong to a b right now what we are going to use we are going to use f is continuous at x naught therefore it is locally bounded at x naught that is there exists a delta interval around x naught on which it is going to be bounded you understand this yeah this is the trick we want to use okay Since f is continuous at x naught, okay, right? F is locally bounded, okay. That means there exists m positive and delta positive, so that for all x in j, that is your j naught, which is a b and mod x minus x naught less than delta we have f x less than equal to m yeah now you see that how we are using now let's look at now let's look at the interval x naught minus n delta to x naught plus delta right now I want to say for n very very large my jn's are contained in this interval x naught minus delta to x naught plus delta I want to prove this okay this is our claim okay let's try to understand what it means that means if you give me any x in jn then that x must be in x naught minus delta to x naught plus delta that means mod x minus x naught should be strictly less than delta right but remember x and x naught where do they lie they lie in jn okay what is jn that is a and b n and and what is its length 2 to the power minus n into b minus a right my x naught and x may be some two points here therefore the distance 
between x and x naught will be less than or equal to 2 to the power minus n b minus a. This is the maximum possible distance for any x in j n and x naught. Do you follow that? Right? Now, you are given delta the sequence 2 to the power minus n b minus a that goes to 0. Therefore, for a given delta, for this delta, there is a capital N such so that 2 to the power minus n b minus a will be less than delta. Yeah? Therefore, for all n greater than or equal to n, 2 to the power minus n b minus a will be less than delta. Do you accept it? Yeah? Now we are through. So in particular, my J n is okay. J J n for all n greater than equal to n is contained in x naught minus delta to x naught plus delta. Okay, right. Now what is our choice of J n? J n are chosen is chosen in such a way that. f is not bounded on j n. Now recall what I said therefore there exists an x n in j n so that modulus of f x n is greater than n. Yeah? By Archimedean property I said that we remember. Let us go back just to make sure that you understand. Yeah. So, this is our thing I am using for each n if f is not bounded then there is an xn in the interval okay our interval is a and b n now okay so that mod f x n is greater than n you understand right okay that means for all n greater than or equal to n my xn's lie in the interval x naught minus delta to x naught plus delta right but since xn lies here what we know we know that f is locally bounded right therefore since xn belong to this right xn uh, x minus x naught is less than xn minus x naught is less than delta right xn minus x naught is less than 2 to the power less than or equal to 2 to the power minus n b minus a but that's strictly less than delta Right? Therefore, f of x n must be less than or equal to m. Right? Therefore, for all n, this implies modulus f x n is less than or equal to n. But remember, this implies for all n greater than or equal to n, n which is strictly less than mod f x n is less than or equal to m. Right? So, I have n onwards okay all these numbers are bounded therefore that means okay the, that means for all n natural number my n is less than or equal to m this is a contradiction why what did the Archimedean property say give me any m positive there exists some natural number k so that k is greater than n right but what I am saying all natural numbers are less than or equal to m yeah therefore this is a contradiction Archimedean property. Therefore, why the contradiction arose? Okay, therefore, hence we can we conclude our assumption that F is not bounded on a b is false okay that means we have proved the result you see that so i took pains to bring out the 
importance of Archimedean property also on the way. Okay. You will see if you learn proofs like this, your test for analysis will also improve. You will also understand why certain things are working the way they work. Okay. And uh, I'll just take five more minutes to show the bounds are attained also. Yeah. Just to quickly. But I'm able to recall, you know, LEB property, GLB property, etc. So maybe, okay, I leave it to you. Okay, you look at my book or others, okay. I just wanted to give application of Nestor and Robert Theorem, which I have given. Okay, that's enough, I believe. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you like this expo thing. And do not hesitate to download my article. Okay, there I have actually proved a real value convenience function on a closed and bounded interval attains its bounds. Okay, it's a second step for this theorem that is also proved. One usually calls it extreme value theorem. Okay, that's also proved and it's also done in any book, in my analysis book also. Okay, I am not giving that proof, but please read it. Okay, I hope you enjoyed these three lectures and as I said, Nestor interval theorem or bijection met bisection method. Okay. These are very important tool in analysis. So learn them well, okay. In a little more abstract setup also, the same kind of arguments work, okay. You may not have an interval there, but you may have something what is called a compact set in a metric space, diameter, various kinds of notions one can get. But don't be intimidated. Just learn this well. Learning this well will help you progress better, okay. All the best.